Good morning, thank you for taking the time to attend this presentation. My name is Chris and I lead the scientific support team at Drug Bank. Today I will be talking about trends in drug discovery efforts during the 21st century so far, as discerned from publicly available data. So as I mentioned, I work at Drug Bank where we're building the most comprehensive, up-to-date, and accurate knowledge base of drugs and related biomedical data. I say building because as you're all aware, the rate at which new research is emerging means we'll have work forever. Between our AI and team of medical experts, we're constantly updating and improving our data, which has grown to be quite extensive, as you can see here with the numbers of data points for some of our key data sets. And it is this extensive data that has made all of the work that I will be sharing today possible. To give you an idea of today's presentation, to begin, I will briefly discuss why it can be useful to investigate trends within the drug discovery space. And then next, I will talk about some trends that I've found within our data over the time period of from 2000 until 2022. For this part, I'll begin by discussing some trends in approved drugs over this time period, including a focus on disease areas treated and the properties of novel targets. And then finally, I will talk about trends in clinical trials, including those focused on rare diseases. So let's talk a little bit about trends. We all have some interesting trends, whether they can be trends in fashion, in music, or in the industry. Trends can help us to understand how an area evolves over time and make predictions about the future, so they can be quite useful. A huge part of my role at Drug Bank is keeping an eye on current and emerging trends in the industry, and this is largely why I've chosen this topic to share with all of you today. Of course, with the current pace at which biomedical research advances, I often end up feeling like this most days. So with the increasing rise of AI-based technologies, it can be easy to downplay or forget the value of more traditional data analysis. However, detailed studies of historical data can help to provide context and insight into our everyday work. For example, in 2018, a large consortium of authors published a paper on what they call the unexplored therapeutic opportunities in the human genome. Using a variety of information, they determined that only about 3% of the human proteome, or roughly 600 proteins, was targeted by therapeutics. Within that 3%, the majority fell into just a few classes of proteins, GPCRs, ion channels, enzymes, kinases, and a group that they label other. In terms of functions or pathways, these proteins are all largely involved in things like signaling, transport, and regulation. Now, these observations are interesting for a few reasons. They suggest that some protein classes are inherently easier or more valuable to modulate with drugs than others. They suggest that there are many potential targets that we either haven't attempted to affect yet, or that would require different paradigms that are slowly becoming more feasible, such as gene therapy. And lastly, in the study, they found that 38% of the proteome has very little associated information at either the biological or chemical levels. And this section is one that they call T-DARK. The significance of this portion is unknown, but it represents an exciting opportunity for future research. So this study and other similar studies like it pose interesting questions about the nature of drug discovery. As it has been a few years since the study came out and the original study didn't cover all areas of the drug discovery process, I have been playing around with our data in an attempt to expand on this earlier work. So when considering trends in drug approvals, it is first appropriate to ask which molecules have been approved. This figure represents the approval of new ingredients as represented by their prescription marketing start date. Note that this is different from FDA approvals as these represent individual active ingredients as opposed to, say, for example, approved combo products, which constitute a single approval in the FDA's eyes. What is clear from this slide is that while the number of new small molecules is fairly constant over time, the number of new biotech active ingredients has increased dramatically since the mid 2000s. This likely reflects not only improvements in manufacturing technology, but also the rise of new types of drugs, such as antibody drug conjugates and CAR-T therapies. In order to understand more about these approved drugs, we looked at their indications. By mapping their indicated conditions to ICD-10 codes, we can group them into larger categories of disease area. What we found was that there is a preponderance towards cancer drugs, 
and those treating hematological, gastrointestinal, and infectious conditions. On the flip side, some conditions such as those related to pregnancy, congenital abnormalities, and ear conditions had such small counts that we've actually excluded them from this figure to improve the overall clarity. So the takeaway here is that there is clearly an uneven distribution of drugs across target disease areas. To get a better sense of the distribution of these indications, we plotted the relative density as a function of time within each category. Now this data is slightly skewed because we had to associate all indications to the original drug approval dates, which means the data is skewed slightly to the left. But there are still some interesting trends that we can observe. Notably, it is clear that neoplasms have had more recent interest, including a very large spike around 2015, and that there is a small peak centered roughly over mid-2020 or 2021 for infectious and respiratory diseases, and this likely reflects indications as a result of the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Another important question to ask about these drugs is what their targets are and whether they represent new therapeutic targets or are improved activity for an existing target. What we found is that the number of novel targets, i.e. those that have never been a therapeutic target of a previously approved drug, oscillates substantially from year to year, but averages approximately 15 per year over the time period in question. And this is interesting because it means that we are still able to effectively find new targets. However, based on a rough estimate of approximately 1,500 proteins for what is called the druggable genome, this means that it would take over 50 years to target the entirety of this data set at the current rate. The next question is what kinds of proteins are present within this set of novel targets? So using Uniprot's own family classification, we could get a rough sense of this distribution. Of the top results, the majority could be classified as kinases, GPCRs, ion channels, various enzymes, such as HDACs, cyclases, and peptidases, and again, a category that we've simply labeled as other. Unsurprisingly, this largely matches the results from the previous 2018 study that I showed in the introduction but with a larger share for kinase, kinases, suggesting that they have been targeted more in the last four to five years. And this is also consistent with the recent growth in cancer indications, as many kinase inhibitors have anti-cancer properties. Finally, we decided to cluster these targets by their common GO terms as a surrogate for their function and known properties. By reducing the data to its first three principal components, we can roughly visualize the resulting clusters. Three groups relating to ion channels, GPCRs, and various other cell membrane proteins and receptors clustered together, likely in part due to their shared cellular location. Another two groups of enzymes and HDACs are present, while intracellular kinases, receptor tyrosine kinases, and immune-related components form their own separate groups. The fact that we can identify clear clusters within this data set further supports the idea that we have largely focused on specific types of proteins and cellular functions for therapeutic purposes in the current millennium. So now we're going to switch gears and briefly discuss some trends in clinical trials. One important caveat for all of the information that I'll share in the next couple of slides is that these trials represent a subset of all trials restricted to those that involve drugs as an intervention. Now, one obvious question surrounds the time it takes to successfully complete a clinical trial. And what we found from the data was that trials are now taking approximately one year longer on average than they were in the early 2000s. And as would be expected, Phase one trials take less time than either phase two or phase three trials. Although the exact reasons for this increase in trial length over time are unclear, it may be due to increasingly complex trial designs, a higher burden of evidence from recent approvals, issues with recruitment or trial execution, or some other combination of factors. 
Now, similarly to what we did with the indicated drugs, we can also map the conditions under investigation during clinical trials to ICD-10 codes. Doing so produces a graph like the one on the slide here and shows a couple of interesting trends. Namely, there is a clear preponderance for cancer trials and relatively steady growth of these trials over time. A huge number of trials that here are labeled as other could not easily be mapped to ICD-10 codes, and this likely reflects the messiness of clinical trials data. There's also a huge spike for infectious and respiratory disease centered roughly on 2020, which again is a signal in the data reflecting the recent COVID-19 pandemic. And then all other disease areas comprise a minority of the total trials with modest growth over time, and these have been grayed out on the slide for clarity. As before, trials related to pregnancy, congenital abnormalities, and ear conditions were omitted for clarity and because they represent such a small portion of the overall total. So now we're going to switch gears again and talk a little bit about rare diseases to finish up. So at any given time, millions of people, roughly 3.5 to 5.9% of the global population, suffer from rare conditions without effective treatments or cures. These limited numbers of patients translate to scarce information, making research into these conditions risky and expensive. And in the earliest stages of drug discovery, curating reliable scientific data, identifying relevant previous trials, and designing protocols for success are all important, challenging, and time-consuming tasks. To this end, we recently added a large amount of data on US FDA organ designations, the conditions for which can be considered as rare diseases. The FDA Organ Drug Act was passed in 1983, providing incentives for development in these underserved areas. And as we can see, since 2000, the number of yearly designations and the number of matching clinical trials, i.e. those that have the same drugs and conditions, have steadily increased. And these numbers suggest that overall, the incentives offered by programs such as the Orphan Drug Act are effective in promoting clinical development in these areas. Another interesting feature of this data set is that we've classified the reasons for trial termination, as provided by the investigators, into 30 standardized categories, including marking those that suggest safety or efficacy concerns. So as you can see in this figure, the data itself is quite extensive, and I'm not going to ask you to try and interpret this in the time period that we have. There are two very important takeaways that I'd like to give you. The first one is that overall, only about 14% of rare disease trials stop due to safety or efficacy concerns. And of the remaining 86%, more than half of these fail due to recruitment or business decisions, which makes sense in the context of rare diseases. So to summarize, we've investigated several areas within the drug discovery landscape and identified some interesting trends. When considering drug approval since 2000, biotech drugs are increasingly popular. There are biases towards certain areas, such as cancers and gastrointestinal or blood disorders. And we are still able to identify new entities, but these largely fall into certain classes and functions. Considering clinical trials since 2000, these are growing in both number and duration, and now take about a year longer on average as they did compared to the early 2000s. This growth is also present in rare disease trials, but these suffer largely from recruitment issues. And as with indications, there are clear biases in investigated disease areas, including huge amounts of interest in cancer, but not so much in other areas. So I hope you found this relatively brief analysis interesting. We will likely continue to expand and refine these analyses over time. Of course, I couldn't have produced this analysis without the wider drug bank team who work hard every day to improve our knowledge base. I'd like to especially thank Alex, Ray, Marisol, and Seth for providing feedback on the work and to Tara and Chantel for help in preparing these slides. Thank you very much for your attention. If you found this interesting, want to know more, or just want to chat, please come see us at booth number 308 and consider connecting with us online. And I'll now take any questions that you may have.